Do you want to enhance your world with mythical creatures? Do you want to find out more about humanity's history? Do you want to go from spirits of the wind to loathsome creatures and to the bane of sailors? Let's talk about something I am sure was not taught to you in school. Let's talk about harpies and sirens, the nightmarish creatures that low-level parties dread. Hello all you wonderfully funky people, Funky Monkey here, welcome to today's episode. How are you? How's life treating you? All good? Perfect. On today's episode we will dive in the ancient Greek mythology and talk about two entities that can easily be used to enhance your world if you're a world builder, make it feel more alive, more dangerous, help you weave low to mid level adventures and enthrall your players. And if you're not into world building, I'm sure you'll be fascinated about the stories I will impart with you. Their original and initial appearance, role and behavior will surprise you, especially when compared to how we represent them today. I mean, who hasn't heard of harpies? Heck, the word is even used defamatory to describe a mean-spirited old woman. And who hasn't seen the Little Mermaid? Before we begin our story, let's talk about what I will be painting today. Before I start talking about the miniature, two things have changed and hopefully improved. I'll start with the quality and detail of my painting videos. I got a new macro lens for my camera for more detail, clarity and focus on the miniature, as you can see. It drove me nuts that I sometimes lost focus of the painting and ruined the video. Not that it was an often occurrence, but it was often enough to drive me crazy and I wanted a closer look at the miniature painting process that I didn't get with my previous lens. The second improvement are my zenithals. I got an airbrush to help me with smooth and on-point zenithal highlights. Nothing fancy, a very small compressor version that suits my needs and allows me to slowly learn how to use an airbrush without being hurt by my neighbors late in the evening when I paint. I will tell you this. It's a learning curve, but I think it's worth it and I'm getting there. And with that, let's talk about the actual miniature. Today I will continue with Battle Sister number 5 of 7. I started the painting journey with the Adeta Sororitas miniatures that I have. Each miniature has gotten and will get a different treatment, each being a lesson. It's time to paint a Sister Repentia, my first ever, and I decided to go with a dark skin tone. I did this because I realized I don't really know how to properly paint dark skin tones, so it's a very good exercise. I plan on shining a very bright light from above this battle sister and will try and reflect this on the highlights, on the skin and on the gear. A new miniature, a new lesson and I really love the dynamic pose a miniature has but I don't really know how to better play around with this aspect, guess I'll see as I go along see if I can bring it into play more. I will go with the classic color scheme, red headpiece, black volleyball gear, black sports shoes, come on, don't tell me that that's not what they look like. And silver chain sword with gold details. To that effect, I will go from corn red to fire dragon breath for the headpiece and from abaddon black to incubi darkness to grey sear for the clothes and from lead belcher to stormhose silver for the weapon. As for the skin, I will be playing around with Rhinox Hide, Mournfang Brown and Barbarian Flesh. Now on with the story. Ok, before we start our story, let's go through the pre-story checklist, make sure everything is in place. I don't have any coffee right now as it is very late in the evening, but I do have some wonderful wonderful tea in my mousse cup. My assistants are around here somewhere, they just ate, so they might make an appearance later on. And I have something, something for the soul. How about you? Do you have anything to soothe the soul and loosen the tongue when sharing stories? Share in the comments below what gets you in the story sharing mood. Now, are you ready for a story? Do you have something tasty to drink on hand? If not, I'm gonna give you a minute or two. Get something that makes this even more enjoyable. Already? Awesome. Then I think it's time for a story. We will start our journey through ancient mythology with the harpies. 
In ancient Greek and Roman mythology, they were represented as half-women, half-birds, storm spirits. They were depicted as birds with female heads, pale skin and long, sharp talons. Depending on the source, they were either represented as being very beautiful maidens, usually by the Greeks, or shockingly ugly, by Roman sources. Given their large, sharp talons, they were depicted as birds of prey. No, not that kind. Because Greek mythology, like mythologies across the world and throughout time, is very tightly intertwined, the harpies have a connection with multiple other entities in the Greek mythology. Their role was to snatch up murderers, especially those who committed this heinous crime against their families, and bring them to the Erinys, the Furies. If you want to find out more about the Furies, I have a video on that, link is right over there. It is quite interesting if I say so myself. They were tasked with bringing criminals before the Furies and tortured those deserving of it while they were being carried away by the Harpies to Tartarus, the Greek abyss, and a prison to Titans. Given their task, they were considered to be very cruel, very violent and vicious in their endeavors, taking pleasure in enacting these punishments on those they caught. Moreover, the Greeks also believed that when somebody vanished from the face of the earth without a trace, they were most likely taken by the harpies. This also might mean that not all of those these creatures were abducting were actually guilty of something. Now, a little treat for the world builders out there. The harpies were believed to be the guardians of the underworld, alongside many other dark creatures including Cerberus. I'm sure you can easily use this somehow in your world building. Now, when it came to their origin, it was unknown to the Greeks or any other ancient people where the harpies hailed from, but it was believed that they resided either in a cave on the Isle of Crete close to where Zeus was hidden after his birth so that the cannibal titan Kronos would not be able to eat him, or they resided at Orcus's gates guarding the entrance. For the ancient Etruscans and Romans, again a small nugget for the world builders out there, Orcus was the god of the underworld and of broken oaths, also lending his name to the underworld. He was more broadly known as Pluto. but. Orcus is still the Roman god of the underworld, in some circles. Harpies were associated with Zeus, and they were called Zeus's hounds or ministers of the Thunderer, being storm spirits. Now, as you might expect it if you know anything about the Greek mythos, most of their mythical creatures, again, as I just mentioned, were somehow related. So let's talk about harpies and their family. Being spirits of the storm and Zeus's hounds, it is only natural that they were somehow related to other sky or air entities. Actually, they were sisters to Iris, the goddess of rainbows and the messenger of the Olympian gods, especially Hera. If you want to know more about rainbows and about Iris, check out my previous video. It is quite interesting. You love it. So, we know that they were Iris's sister. This also means that they were Arcus's sisters. The one who chose to be the messenger for the Titans uh, instead of the Olympians and got her wings ripped off when the Olympian gods were victorious over the Titans. They were the daughters of Thaumas, a god of the sea, and the Oceanid Electra, one of the 3000 Oceanids in Greek mythology. Their names were Elo, translated as Storm Swift, Okipete, or the Swift Wing, and later Selano, the Dark, was added. Homer mentions another harpy called Podarge, or Fleetfoot. He also mentions in his works that Podarge was the mother of two of the fastest and immortal horses in Greek mythology, Balius and Xanthus. Their father was the West Wind, Zephyrus. They were also the parents of other legendary horses, such as Phlogeus and Harpagos, gifted by Hermes to the twins 
Castor and Pollux, and were also parents to Arion, a black-maned legendary swift horse. We'll talk about them another time. You know the drill, another story for another time. Now, for some stories around the harpies that might inspire you. The first one revolves around the king of Thrace, a land north of Greece, Phineus. The king was gifted with the power of prophecy by Zeus, and he used this power to reveal the future of humanity to other mortals. This enraged Zeus. As a punishment, he made the king pick one option. Lose his sight or lose his life. The king chose to never see the sun again as he was afraid of dying. Zeus added an additional punishment to this and sent his hounds, the harpies, to torment Phineus. Legends say that they spoiled his food whenever he wanted to eat, either by leaving droppings on it or snatching it up and throwing it in dung or simply stealing it and eating it themselves. This meant that Phineus could never actually eat but, according to his punishment, nor could he die. Eventually, he was found by Jason and his Argonauts. When found, the blind king promised the Argonauts guidance to safe waters if they were to chase away the harpies. Among Jason's crew were the king's brothers-in-law, Calais and Zetes, the Boreads, the sons of the northern wind Boreus, who were also able to fly. They were fated to defeat the harpies, according to the king, and deliver him from his curse, and thus, in essence, delivering the Argonauts to safe shores. They brainstormed and came up with a plan. Phineus sat down to eat something while guarded by the Boreads. The moment he was about to touch food, the harpies swooped down and stole his food, flying away with it. The Boreads gave chase to the harpies, and one by one the harpies fell from the sky from exhaustion. When the brothers were about to kill them, Iris, the god's herald, appeared and told the Boreads that it was not yet time for the harpies to die, and that they were told by the gods to leave them be. Iris also swore on Zeus's behalf that the harpies would never again torment Phineus. Once the brothers returned, the king guided the Argonauts through treacherous waters to safety. The full story of Phineus was written by Aeschylus as part of a three parts play in 472 BCE. Because history, mythology and human imagination are weirdly fascinating, there is a more recent story that involves harpies and paladins of all things. The story goes that the Christian Ethiopian king Sanepo was tormented by harpies and was blinded by God, a very striking resemblance to the story of Phineus. But the king was saved from his fate by a paladin of Charlemagne's court by the name of Astolfo. If you want to know more about the first and real paladins in history, check out my video on them, link is right over there. and. I promise it is quite interesting. Nowadays, the harpies are no longer depicted as beautiful women with the bodies of birds of prey. They are almost exclusively depicted as vicious, ugly, vile and cowardly creatures that are not very bright. Oh, and one interesting theory is that the Greeks borrowed the idea of a human-headed bird from the ancient Egyptians with whom they had very close commercial ties throughout history. In ancient Egypt, Ba, the representation of the spirit leaving the body was that of a human-headed bird. It's not a huge stretch of the imagination that they became spirits of the wind and storm in Greek mythology when adapted, but it's just a theory, not a 100% certain thing. Now, to be honest, the idea of them being linked to Orcus somehow gave me a ton of ideas of how to better implement them in my world. They are present, but I've never thought too much about their roles and history and connections to different entities. Having this piece of information opens up so many possibilities. Also, having them be the guardians or some of the guardians of the underworld, even if they are not connected to Orcus, 
in any way still is a great opportunity. I would have them be heralds of some dark entity or even better have an adventure around a group of harpies that are abducting people for dark ritual that is meant to empower the dark entity they are serving. This would be a very awesome low to mid level adventure. Now, this is the perfect moment to turn our attention to the miniature and see how it's coming along. Once I was done with the skin, I turned my attention to the clothes. I applied the first red color to the headpiece to get a preview of how it will turn out and I started working on the volleyball gear. Because I initially decided to go with a bright light from above, every upward facing surface of the gear and clothing and skin will get aggressively highlighted. As you can see, on these areas the clothes are no longer black but transition into a bluish light grey. I realized I am on a journey of learning how to actually highlight my miniatures. It is a learning process and I realized it is a little more difficult than I expected and a lengthy process. It's not that I don't know how to highlight, at least at a basic level, but actually thinking about how the light hits the miniature, properly highlighting a surface depending on the angle, color and intensity of the light, depending on the surface itself, both when it comes to the color and material or texture. All of these came with time. As I've watched my favorite miniature painters over the years, I've picked up a detail or a trick here and there, but it's high time I really focus on this. As it just hit me, the desire to level up a little. Perhaps the fact that I realized I need to start thinking about all of these things is a sign I leveled up. So focus of this video, dark skin tones and bright highlights on black volleyball gear. It won't turn out as I envision it, but it's okay, this is the point of this whole journey I'm on and on which you joined me, to learn how to paint miniatures better. We'll see how it turns out. Back to the story. Welcome back. Perhaps the most interesting difference between mythology and how now we see a mythical creature is the difference between how the Greeks and Romans depicted sirens and how they changed over time and reached the form we know them in today. In ancient mythology, they were depicted as birds with human heads, not unlike harpies. The main difference is that sirens were always depicted as being very beautiful throughout the ages. Sirens were associated with rocky formations that protruded out of water, rocky shores and unusually treacherous waters with rocks or sandbanks that could easily strand or sink a ship. They were believed to entice sailors to either jump overboard to their deaths or steer ships so that they would wreck on rocks and feast on the crews. Perhaps they were figments of the imagination of sailors who were suffering from thirst, from dehydration, from heat stroke, or even some illness like scurvies. In the 3rd century BCE, Apollonius Rhodius described them in his works the Argonautica as part birds, part women. But they were mentioned centuries earlier by Homer in the Odyssey, in the 8th or 7th century BCE, although Homer never actually described them in detail. As in the Harpies case, they were probably influenced by the Egyptian Ba. And although initially represented as small birds with female heads, in time they began to change, answering the needs the ancient Greeks had. They began being represented as having the upper body of a human and the lower body of a bird and sometimes, sometimes they were even represented without wings. So just women with bird-like lower bodies. And they started being represented as playing different instruments, leaning more into the idea of them being able to enthrall those hearing their songs. The most often represented instruments were the lyre, the kitara, and the aulos, a double flute that sounded somewhat like a pipe. You know it from the many representations of satires. Because people's imagination is insatiable and they need to make sense of things even when talking about fantasy, and because perhaps people needed to have sirens who did not live on rocks or sandbanks, 
in the 3rd century BCE, the first isolated depictions of mermaids appear, creatures that were half women, half fish. They were believed to inhabit the west coast of Italy near Naples and initially the sirens were only two in number. Then the number rose to three, then to four, then to eight. Now let's talk about their family. Their father was believed to be, according to some sources, the river god Achelos, and their mother one of the muses, either Terpsichore, Melpomene or Calliope, the youngest. If you want to learn more about the muses, I have a video on them too. Make sure you check it out. Because the numbers changed over time and because Greece in ancient times was not a single state but a collection of independent city-states, each with its own traditions, myths, beliefs, etc. There are variations in their names and numbers. I will try to list their names as they were mentioned in later sources that gathered all other sources roughly around the moment they reached 8, but this is very difficult as they overlap. Their names were Thelxipea, Molpe, Himerope, Aglaopea, Piscinoe, Parthenope, Ligea, Leucosia, Raidne, and Teles. If you are paying attention, you notice that I listed 10 names. Again, too many sources that tell different stories, give different names and numbers. This is what happens when you have different sources from different moments in time, from different parts of the world, more or less. And most likely, multiple sources were referring to the same entities, but used a different name. Now, for a few stories of how they came to be. First up, Ovid, in the 1st century BC, 1st century CE. This one is linked to the story of the Hore, or the Seasons. Link is right over there. The idea is that the goddess Persephone, the mentor's daughter, was kidnapped by Hades and taken to the underworld. Persephone was the goddess of spring and vegetation, while the mentor was the goddess of agriculture, harvest, fertility, birth and marriage, and many other things. While picking flowers one day, Persephone was accompanied by several spirits. In essence, water spirits. These spirits were close by when Persephone was kidnapped, but they couldn't do anything. They went searching for their mistress, but could not find her. Now, there are two versions of this story. One tells us that they begged the gods for wings so they may fly over the seas in search of their goddess, while the other tells us that Demeter was so angry and heartbroken because of her daughter's abduction, and the inability of her companions to prevent it, that she punished those in Persephone's retinue for not saving her and turned them into sirens. One of the stories that talks about their behavior and how to avoid becoming their victim comes from the Odyssey in the 8th or 7th century BC from Homer. Perhaps this is one of the best known sources and most famous story that talks about sirens. What I personally like about this story is that it includes one of the first sorceress or witches in Greek mythology, Kirkia. By the way, if you are curious to find out more about sorcerers and sorceress, I have a video on that. I have a video on everything! Well, not everything, I'm getting there, but my portfolio is slowly growing. Make sure you check it out, you'll enjoy it, I'm sure. And I also have videos on many other fantasy classes if you are curious. Okay, back to the Odyssey. So, Odysseus was curious to hear the songs of the sirens, but knew better than to do it without safety measures. At Kirke's advice, he plugged the ears of his crew members with beeswax and had them tie him to the main mast as best as they could. He also instructed them to not release him, no matter how much he asked and begged. They did so and sailed in the waters, owned, controlled by the sirens. The sirens sang to lure the sailors in the water where they could feast, but the sailors did not hear their song. Odysseus, on the other hand, begged and pleaded with his men to release him so he could join the sirens, 
But the more he begged, the tighter they tied the ropes. Eventually, they managed to get to safe waters, away from the sirens, and he was released from his binds once his men saw the frown on his face and the sadness in his eyes come and go. What is interesting is that later authors added the idea to the legends that the sirens died once any man heard their song and managed to escape their lure. Odysseus did just that. Therefore, according to legend, the sirens jumped in the waters and drowned themselves. Remember, at this point in our story, they are still depicted as half birds, half women. A few centuries later, in the 3rd century BCE, again Apollonius Rhodius writes in his work Argonautica that Jason was warned by Chiron, the centaur. By the way, centaurs will get their own video at one point. Again, say it with me, that's another story for another time. Anyway, Chiron warns Jason that Orpheus must be part of the Argonauts if they are to succeed in their quest. A little DNPC maneuver there. As Jason and the Argonauts were sailing, they entered waters controlled by sirens. As they started playing, Orpheus also started playing, drowning out the song of the sirens with his divine voice and skills. The only Argonaut who heard their song was the hero Butes, who actually jumped ship but was saved at the last moment by Aphrodite as his quest was not over yet. Because of course there are always people who call into doubt legends and myths. We have Pliny the Elder who comes close to doing so but does mention an individual who swears sirens are real. In his work, Naturalis Historia, one of the most complete and vast Roman encyclopedias that have survived in most part, Pliny mentions that a certain Dinon, father of Clehus, a famous writer, swears that in India, the faraway land, sirens existed, charming men with their songs and dance, and once asleep, they would tear them asunder and feast on them. In this account, we can see a darker side of the sirens reinforced, one that begins to be the most prevalent. Pliny writes his Encyclopedia in the 1st century CE. Time passed and mythology changed. The Christian influence took hold, intermingled with different legends and myths, and over a thousand years later, in the 8th century CE, in the Anglo-Latin catalogue Liber Monstruorum, a sort of medieval monster manual, the mermaids appear for the first time described in writing and are mentioned in the form we know them in today upper body of a woman and lower body of a fish at the same time in the 10th century ce the byzantine encyclopedia of the ancient mediterranean world suda greek mythology still had a foothold and sirens were still represented as being women with sparrow heads or sparrows with women's heads so the classic theme was still in fashion and there was still a clear division between mermaids and sirens. What is interesting is that the Greeks, Romans and their descendants already had a half-human, half-fish entity, Triton, with a whole mythology behind him and thus they could easily maintain the clear distinction between sirens and mermaids or mermen or merfolk. But again, Another story for another time. Now, as a world builder, I believe that you can easily integrate sirens in this antiquated form in your world, creating a clear distinction between mermaids and sirens. They could be of the same people but evolve separately somehow for some reason, in isolation, or have some of them devote themselves to a different deity leading to a great schism between them that led to different shapes. Some of them cannot leave the deep waters of the oceans while the others, although still drawn to the ocean, cannot live in it, instead patrolling the skies above it. Perhaps they are in the service of a kraken and the flying sirens are his scouts, luring sailors to the depths so that the kraken can gain more servants, who knows. 
these ideas came to me while researching for this video. So this is basically off the top of my head. You can take these creatures and run with them however you please. The possibilities are endless. The only limit is your imagination. Now, let's take one more look at the miniature before we start wrapping things up. Now let's focus on the weapon. I'm using Stormhost Silver to Edge Highlight the Chain Sword. I realize I need more silver paints as I usually go directly from Lead Belcher with a black wash to Lead Belcher to Stormhost Silver and I feel I need a little bit more subtle transitions. I was very very tempted to add some blood, guts and gore to the chain sword, but at the very last moment I decided against it. This battle sister has just made planet fall and is fresh off the dropship, so she is rushing into battle and she is only a few hundred meters away from her target. If she survives long enough traversing the battlefield, she will get her chain sword dirty, but until then everything is sparkly clean. Once I'm happy with the highlights on the weapons, I turn my attention to the sockets all over her body as they too need highlights. Of course there is a back and forth between areas that I want highlighted or highlighted more brightly as I go around the miniature. Now for the gold details, the fleur de lis and the skulls. I realize that I need more variety when it comes to gold metallic paints too as I always go from Retributor Armor to Liberator Gold and I need more variety in my life. But every trip to the hobby store is dangerous as I would buy every possible color if I were to be left unsupervised. Okay. Now let's start wrapping our story up. These sorts of creatures, harpies and sirens, are not limited or exclusive to Europe or to the ancient Greeks or Romans. Oh no! Their origin is much much older and their stories are much more widely spread. In the Hindu and Buddhist mythology we have Kinara, a creature that is part human and part bird. The classic upper body human, lower body bird, a swan actually in this case. They were associated with music and love and they would look after humans, especially in times of danger. Their main instrument is the Kinari Vina, a zither with gourds as resonating chambers that can be traced back around 500 CE. They inhabited the Himavanta a mythical forest at the foot of the Himalaya. In Burma, it is believed that out of the 136 lives lived by the Buddha, four of them were spent as a Kinara. Kalavinka is the half-human, half-bird mythical creature of Buddhism. This creature is said to dwell in the Western Pure Land, a legendary realm in Buddhism, and it is believed that it preaches the Dharma. It is believed to have a very beautiful voice and that it sings while it's still in its unhashed egg. In Japanese, it has various titles such as Godly Sounding Bird and or Exquisite Sounding Bird. Now, on the other side of the world, in Costa Rica and Panama, we have Tule Vieja, the ghost of a beautiful young woman who had an affair with a man in her village. She got pregnant and after birthing their child, she drowned the infant in a river. God punished her and turned her into a hideous creature. She was turned into a short woman with thick body, large lactating breasts, and bird or bat wings, bird of prey legs, and tangled hair. Depending on the legend, she seeks out children to breastfeed them, sometimes even abducting them, while other times she's a vengeful spirit seeking out and punishing lustful men and bad fathers. The only way to escape her is to recite a specific prayer. The legend is an old one actually and it has its roots in Talamancan mythology. And in that mythology she was a spirit of the wind, of the mountains and of rain. We could go on and on and talk about the Sirin of the medieval Rus people inspired by Persian merchants who were trading in Kiev and Kersonesos in Crimea in the 9th and 10th century. Or talk about the Slav legend of the Alkonost, who rolls her eggs in the sea to hatch there and unleashes sea storms. Or even the Karura, the divine creature with the body of a human and the head of a bird from Japanese mythology. But then I wouldn't be able to make videos on them separately. As you can see, mythology abounds with creatures that can easily be integrated in 
your world with a minimum of effort. You can pick and choose whatever suits your world and style better. Or you can copy paste all of them in your world and enhance it. Uh, make it feel more alive or even more threatening. And with that, if you enjoyed this video and found value in it, please make sure you like as it shows me it was useful. Subscribe and join this wonderful growing funky community. Hit the bell so you are notified when the next video is out and share it with your friends, your GMs, your DMs, your storytellers, your creators, your players, neighbors, family, pets, friends, grandparents, everyone. Oh, and if you want to see more of my lovely assistants who are slowly becoming a uh, site for sore eyes, make sure you check out TW Creative hyphen or minus cats, a channel with shorts that have nothing to do with history and everything to do with cat adventures. Potato's 10th name is Paws. Thank you so much for the privilege of your time. I truly hope you found some inspiration and learned something new today. And I can't wait to see you all funky people here next time on Funky Monkey MP, the place where you get your dose of miniature painting, history, world building and trivia. Remember, be curious, take inspiration from the past and never stop learning, world building and creating amazing things, whatever those are. Your mind and imagination are awesome and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Until next time, have yourselves a wonderful, wonderful, funky day. Cheers. Pliny writes his like Pliny writes in his Pliny writes his Pliny writes his like.